Hi everyone, welcome to breakout session A. Today we'll be talking about um, modeling traffic emissions and air pollution. We have four uh, wonderful talks to hear from today. Uh, please be sure to use the Q&A during any of the talks today to, to ask your questions and we can uh, we have a few minutes at the end of each presentation uh, for those questions and um, I'll be able to read them to the speakers. We'll kick off today with our first presenter, Yu Chi Chen. We'll be talking about a surrogate approach for estimating vehicle related emissions under heterogeneous traffic conditions. Thanks. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the, um, thank you for the um, introduction and organizing uh, for the, for the uh, session, Christine, and also the, the other um, members who are, who are joining this session today. So um, today, I'm glad to share um, some of my research related to, to vehicle-related emission estimation. And um, so this work is done uh, at, uh, with my student, Winton Zhang, and also uh, uh, another faculty member, Nathan Huyn, at the University of South Carolina, as well as the uh, Gurchen Comet, Dr. Gurchen Comet at a, a Benedict College. So, uh, Firstly, I want to talk a little bit about the background uh, and the motivation of the of this research. So, I think um, most of us have been knowing like vehicle related ve emission is a very important. Um, on road vehicle emission is very important. Uh, it's a major contributor to the to the um, emission in the atmosphere, and uh, and also um, when we are doing a lot of transportation project evaluation. It's the on-road vision, vehicle emission estimation or quantification is very important to understand the its environmental impact of, of any transportation activities. So, so and then when we are going into the vehicle emission um, estimation and analysis, we are really kind of they are facing kind of trade-off between accuracy and also uh, computational intensity or um, resource and or demanding resources. So specifically, I think in the in the um, area of vehicle emission estimation, there are many two types of model. One, I would classify them as a microscopic model, and another <clears throat> is called a microscopic model. So for the macros macroscopic vehicle, vehicle emission model, they normally use uh, kind of aggregated factors to infer vehicle emissions, such as they normally were uh, estimated based on the average speed of vehicle or temperature um, or ambient temperature. And no, most of the time, they estimate vehicle emission or emission rate um, at uh, either a um, road link level or um, at a trip level. So examples of this kind of model are, for example, the, the moves uh, average speed approach, or we, which is essentially an emission rate lookup table, which they, as I show in this figure, uh, it, it just show a relationship between the um, um, CO2 emission rate as, as a function of the, um, of the average speed. So this type of model normally they are very easy to use, and um, they are easy to use. But sometimes they are uh, they they have some um, concerns on the accuracy, especially in most of time they trying to use some average um, performance metrics such as average speed to represent present the, um, the whole driving uh, dynamics. So for example, this is, this is a figure where I, I hear a lot of um, echo. Was there something? You so I, are you hearing me? Okay. Are you hearing me? Yes, okay? I can hear you. You sound, you sound okay. good to me. Okay. Yeah. I just feel a lot of echo on my side, but uh, I will just continue. So there are a lot of, so for example, for vehicle driving, if you look at an instantaneous speed, all those speed uh, up and down, but uh, in those microscopic emission model, they normally just use the average model to average emission rate to estimate one uh, reference to one emission rate. So um, the second type
reach all those driving data at a very high resolution. For example, one hertz or one second to quantify vehicle emissions. So specifically, they try to account for those dynamic and driving conditions, and claim to be to be more accurate when they are quantifying emission,、um, quantifying vehicle emission. So, so this in, in these examples,、uh, we will have、uh, like moves. Uh, operating mode approach, which I I, I think some of you have been、uh, familiar. Uh, basically, in the moves operating mode, they they classify each、um, second of driving condition into one of the operating mode bin, and then they will provide one estimation of emission rate for each operating mode bin, and then estimate the emission at each second, and then aggregate them into a into a certain And、time duration like an hour or a minute, and also there are models developed by、uh, UC Riverside、uh, or Virginia Tech, which、uh, they are essentially、uh, using different mo-、uh, methods, statistic or physical based method, to estimate the、um, vehicle emission at every second or、uh, every second of vehicle driving. So, for this type of model, no, we normally. Lo- Needing the、um, detailed driving trajectories, which is the second by second vehicle driving、um, profiles, which sometimes are, are、um, hard or expensive and、uh, resource demanding to obtain. So <clears throat> there are some other models trying to find a middle point between them.、Uh, for example, this moves matrix、um, moves <clears throat> moves matrix、uh, model. Uh, which was、um, uh, proposed by by Liu and and et al, and it tried to、um, solve the computational challenge by pre-run the、uh, moves up mode up mode、um, based up analysis. Basically, they will just、uh, run thousands of scenarios for each type of speed or operating being、um, case. And then prepare that emission rate for for each type of cases. Therefore,、uh, when you needed when you needed this type of emission analysis, you just needed to refer their pre-run analysis. So this this type of approach can save a lot of time、uh, on on trying to、uh, when you are going to get the emission analysis. So and and also there are some other、uh, relevant studies、uh, existed. Uh, which trying to find a midpoint, which is the trade-off between the accuracy and also res-、uh, resource demanding in in vehicle emission analysis. So, <clears throat> so again,、um, we we kind of have two type of model, which is one is micro a macroscopic model, which normally are easy to use, and also most of the determining factors used to, to estimate the emission. Are、uh, available widely available to transportation practitioners, such as average speed on a link, or or ambient temperature or things like that. But、um, it potentially can lose some accuracy if you cannot account for the dynamics in vehicle driving.、Uh, on the other hand, there are vehicle,、uh, there are vehicle,、uh, there are microscopic models which、um, potentially. We are doing the prediction at a high at a, at a higher resolution time resolution, and、uh, but but it's also demanding、um, a lot of data and uh, and uh, in data preparation and model is an、um, establishment. So so therefore, what I'm trying to do here is similar to the several previous uh, studies, uh, which is really、uh, which several studies here. Really trying to find a middle、um, point between the micro and macro st-、uh, models is trying to leverage all those microscopic traffic and emission simulation to predict the link level、uh, ve- vehicle emission. So specifically, I think originally, if we only look at this red box, we normally the macro model will do a vehicle a- activity. We are using vehicle activity data like link average speed to predict the link level vehicle emission. But here, what I the my work here is doing is to、um, prepare all those vehicle activity and the link level vehicle emission using 
using a microscopic traffic simulation as well as a microscopic uh, emission simulation to prepare all those inputs and then establish a statistic model to, to do this type of inference. So here is a general framework <coughs> of, the, of, the, uh, of our study. So essentially our, our model can be divided into data preparation, model training, and also application. So I will discuss a little bit more about the data preparation, but essentially what the data preparation do is to run a traffic um, simulation analysis to prepare um, all the driving conditions um, under different traffic condition and, uh, and uh, congestion conditions. And then also running a, um, a microscopic uh, moves up mode based emission analysis to prepare the, to get the emission, microscopic emission for, for all those uh, link level vehicle activities. And then I will, um, I will develop several um, statistic models to, to do the, to explore the relationship between, um, between the, um, and vehicle activity and the vehicle emission. And then finally, I, uh, we think the model, once it's, it is established, it can be used in, in some uh, applications, uh, mainly to quantify the environmental impact of, of various uh, transportation strategies or, or routing or um, management strategies. So specifically for the, for the data preparation, uh, we are, as again, we are doing two type of simulation. One is traffic simulation, which is used to prepare um, the various driving and uh, driving conditions, and also the emission simulation to quantify the vehicle um, uh, emission on the same link. So basically, for the traffic simulation, we will get it. We will start the network with the open street map to get a, 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 a the the transportation network for the, uh, for the study seat area, which is the Columbia uh, city of South Carolina. And then we will, we will put the, all the net, we will integrate the network with the um, oh, tra travel OD demand to, to replicate um, uh, two traffic scenarios. And we use this, um, we simulate this on the Sumo um, platform and then once we did that, we will get all those vehicle trajectories and then we will put those into the moves model uh, to, to, to get the um, emission uh, analysis for the link level, uh, which is essentially this um, uh, emission simulation process. So uh, here is a network uh, which we input. So we import this from the, um, from the open street map into the Sumo network. So because when we did that in conversion, there is a lot of things we needed to do, especially to ensure that um, the, the open street, the network we used in Sumo is a representative of the, of the true network. So uh, after we have do this, all those um, addition of the network, we are, we, are, we are thinking the network we are having in the Sumo simulation is a is very representative to the actual road network, and then once we we once we have that, we kind of input all those uh, origin and demand traffic uh, into this network and, and to simulate all those traffic simulations. So here is just a sna snapshot of all these different traffic simulation um, or the and the vehicle movement. So we we can see that. We have the, the red dot here are, are essentially the passenger cars and then the blue uh, vehicles here are the, uh, are the transit um, buses. So and then in the end of this simulation, we are getting this kind of vehicle trajectory, which, we, which is most important output of this traffic simulation, and as, as well as the input, important um, input to the emission analysis. So the, here we just getting the um, speed, instantaneous speed, uh, at each at each second on each type of link so um, before we do the emission analysis we 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 validate our model against the real traffic observation so we just uh, do a um, um, <clears throat> scan of plot 
uh, of the observed link speed, which we obtained, obtained from those prop-based uh, data uh, from the South Carolina Department of Transportation, as well as our simulation. So we find that the, the Pearson correlation uh, coefficient uh, is about 0.7, uh, which, which they consider as, uh, I think, the PCC uh, between 0.5 and 1 is considered a good correlation. Basically, it means that the, the, there is a close correlation between our simulated link speed, average speed, and the observed link average speed. And, and also then we, we kind of have our setup, our moves uh, simulation uh, setup. So essentially, we use a lot of default value uh, from the, uh, for the move simulation and um, database. And then we, we also convert the, um, the vehicle trajectories into the op-mode distribution on each road link so that we, the move simulation uh, can the moves model can simulate the emissions on each link given all the vehicle trajectories of all the vehicles from the simulation. So here is just a sample output. Essentially, the output we are getting from the moves model is the link-based emission um, quantity by, by pollutant type. So, so after all of this, we are kind of prepare our input and output variables for our statistic analysis. So we have the, we have the uh, input variable as what we summarized from the model, into, uh, including the average link uh, speed, the coefficient of variation of speed, uh, which is, is a measure of how the speed varied during an hour, um, and, and also the link either in time, which we can get because we have the trajectories of all the vehicles driving on that link. So we can get the percentage of either in time and also the heavy duty and traffic volume and also road grade. And then the output is the, um, is the hourly uh, link average emission rate. So we, we did a model selection, uh, mainly looking at the traditional regression model with different parameter setup and also uh, artificial neural network. Uh, to um, to estimate the emission rate, so the the um, the artificial neural network compared with the traditional regression model, they can um, represent a more complex and non-linear relationship between those input variables and the output. Therefore, um, the the artificial neural network, the AAN model, we tend to have a better. Um, prediction performance, which we use the MAP, which is mean absolutely percentage error to, to represent. So, so essentially through this um, uh, model selection process, we identify the stu most suitable model for our estimation. And then um, here is just a, um, a sample of the um, model prediction results. So essentially um, we we compare our prediction against uh, uh, the, the actual moves emission results uh, through the scatter plot. So we can see that most of them are, uh, have a close linear relationship, which means that our AM model can, can replicate it and get the very close results compared to a moves up mode, um, microscopic up mode emission results. And also we can, we can um, visualize those emission rates on the whole network um, because we have the results for the whole network on all the links. So, so I think this is the, uh, these are the kind of preliminary results we have getting. So, so um, as a summary, so we are trying to um, build a model that I can leverage the um, the microscopic traffic and emission simulation to predict the link level of vehicle emissions. Um, and we have been uh, simulate a ver variety of driving conditions in the city scale so that we can get the emission performance of all the um, links within a network. And also we apply the moves model to, to generate the um, emission, uh, vehicle emission to, 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 to predict. So, and also the, the, we try the different statistic models trying to quantify those relationship between the traffic condition and the vehicle emissions. 
So as the final uh, slide, yes. Please wrap up quickly. Please yes. Wrap up. Yes. So the, the this is my last slide. I think uh, they have. Uh, I think we have several things we can we can continue to work on. But I think the major thing will be really to formulate such a reg regime that we can we can um, we can bu build this kind of digital twin, uh, which can which we can use to uh, use based on this simulation platform to build a digital twin uh, to replicate the actual traffic situation and to evaluate their emission uh, impact. So that is all my presentation. Yeah, uh, sorry, I run it over a little bit more. Um, I think we only have time for one really quick question, but there one just came in about um, the most relevant parameters to take into account to mix the two macro and micro scales. If you could just answer that, yes, yes, you can. <laughs> sure, yes. I think the most important one will be the will be the speed and the and the uh, variation of the speed because both in micro and macro. They have been using these type of uh, variables to estimate emission, um, but in my model, I kind of built this um, to to connect these two, and uh, and I think um, this is also a way. This this my this speed is also a way to validate uh, our model is consistent in both micro and macro level uh, through the validation process. So uh, I, I think I can I can discuss in more detail uh, with Christina, and if you want, we can have a private chat. Um, I just uh, um, yes, so, uh, apologize for using too much of time. Great. Thank you. No, no worries. Uh, thank you. Our next speaker is Misty Zamora, and Misty Zamora will be uh, presenting on assessing ambient air pollution concentrations and personal exposures in Baltimore from the Search Project. Misty. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm sure you are all aware that traffic emissions are not emitted universally evenly through a city. Um, so in Baltimore, Maryland, we have deployed a low-cost sensor network so that we could actually characterize the distribution of different pollutants over a city space. And just before I get started, I always like to highlight the team because um, the CERC Center is actually a really large center. There's major components, uh, and I am on one of the projects, which is Project 2. And a couple of people who are just really significant in this project, um, Kirsten Kohler, who's in our, our group here, as well as Drew Gettner and Colby Bueller at Yale. Um, this is really a big team project, and all the work takes a lot of effort to get the sensors deployed and maintained and get the data collected in uh, good um, QC processes. Um, so just quickly, um, so kind of some project objectives. So again, this is project two of the CERT Center. Um, first, we wanted to develop some novel online multi-pollutant monitors to measure air pollutants um, and greenhouse gases. So we really wanted to characterize things that we really think are important exposures to people in a major urban environment. Um, so we do have two different models. So there's a stationary model. So these are the ones actually in the network. And then we also have the portable models, which is similar, but smaller, but can actually be carried on by an individual relatively easily, low burden. And I'll highlight some of those today. Um, also, we wanted to deploy these in a big network in the city, like I mentioned. Um, so we are putting these monitors out so we can do high spatial temporal resolution. Um, so over long periods of time, we get data really, really rapidly um, for these multiple monitors in the Baltimore area. And also a really big part of what we're doing in the search center is looking at the reliability data on these low cost sensors. Um, low cost sensors have a lot of potential. Um, we're really excited about what we can do. They're a lot cheaper. We can deploy them in big numbers in a given city for like you know, a fraction of the cost. Uh, but we really need to understand how the data looks. Um, is it good data? Can we trust the data? Like how much um, weight should we put into these answers that we're putting out there? So kind of big three things we'll touch on today. Um, so first, um, always the most exciting part maybe is looking at the actual monitors that we've developed. Um, so you can see here, it's a picture and I'm holding it. So it's about the size of a toaster. Um, there's two inlets, the gas per PM. Uh, we made it not exciting because these are gonna be out in the city. We don't really want people interacting with them too much. We want them just to kind of blend into the environment. Um, so we can see they're relatively plain. Um, and here's one on a house over here. 
um, you can see in the bottom kind of right side, it's just a small white box hanging on someone's house. Um, so they're out in the city just like that all over. Here's just a snapshot of the inside. Uh, but most exciting about these multi-pollutant monitors is that we measure seven different pollutants um, using these new low-cost sensors. Um, so PM2.5, um, ozone, NO2, NO, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, methane, um, temperature or melting humidity. Again, these kind of important criteria pollutants and some greenhouse gases. And so the other really exciting thing about our network is that we have real time data. Um, so we leverage, first of all, all of our monitors are basically on like a family plan. So we use the Sprint network and they send data in real time to us um, and they go to the Grafana platform. And that's just an open source, so it's free, anybody could use it, platform, and they, we send the data and it plots it for us in real time. And so we get pretty cool maps like this for all anything that we measure. And so we can see here we have about 50 monitors online and they all report data here, I think this is like 10 second intervals. I have plot this over about a month. And this is really useful for this type of low cost network for many reasons. Um, first, because um, these are out in the world, like they're out, you know, they're at libraries, they're at people's houses, and sometimes they just get unplugged. So it's really nice to be able to log on and see um, which monitors are offline. I have it set up where, um, you know, if something's offline for more than two days, it'll send us a Slack message. So there's a really cool interfacing with other technology. Um, then we can send somebody out to go check and see what's going on at the site. And also it's just really cool because we can see the data in real time. There's also always really exciting things happening in the city. You know, um, I'll show up a day on like July 4th where there's different concentrations and it's nice just to be able to like peek in and look at this data from all of our monitors and this really easy interface. Um, so we have deployed uh, at about 46 sites around Baltimore, Maryland. We've moved them around a couple times just depending on people and different questions we're trying to answer. Um, so you can see here is a map. Um, Baltimore City is really in this smaller area here, um, but we really are measuring the whole Baltimore area. So that we were really we're trying to stick within this kind of loop here, if anyone's familiar with the Baltimore City and kind of county area. But we have about 45 monitors in that area. So we can see we have a really nice high density network. So we can get a good idea of the characterizations of, of the different pollutants throughout the city. So again, all of those seven pollutants, we can look at all of these sites in real time. We began installing these in October of 2018, um, and we are still, um, we actually, we've probably hit our, la our cap of how many we're going to install in the city um, just this year, so we've kind of had a rolling deployment. But we also have a couple of nice things. We co-located at reference sites, notably the Maryland Department of the Environment, or MDE, as I might reference them casually, um, on oh, the NIST. NIST has their greenhouse corridor set up between the DC and Baltimore area. And so we have the ability to co-locate both of the measurements that the EPA measures in, through MDE, as well as these greenhouse gases. So we have, you know, real-time methane and CO2 in Baltimore using these high cost instruments so that we can compare to these low cost sensors and really get a good idea of the quality of data we're putting out there. Um, and we chose these sites very strategically because, um, you know, Baltimore is a big area and there's a lot of questions, but we really thought about what do we want to get a good characterization of. And so we weighted certain factors and then we created a model um, that wasn't me, it was Jesse Berman, but um, he created this model to show us where we should place our monitors so that we can get the best picture of Baltimore air pollution. Um, so you can see here um, we, things we considered was like transportation factors and um, we wanted to capture capture these major roads that people are on. We also have a big shipping import industry down in here. And not only are there shipping emissions, but there are the trucks that travel to and from the ships that pick up these things. Um, there's, you know, trains that can travel to and from and move these, <clears throat> these things that are being shipped into the port throughout the city into other parts of the country. And um, we wanted to characterize, you know, important energy sources. Um, so petroleum, terminals, power plants, things like this. Um, and also things just like we know where their air pollution is more likely to be, just kind of using our intuitive knowledge, point sources, like there's an incinerator in Baltimore, but also areas where there's lots of restaurants and things like that, where we know they're going to be putting particulates out in the air. We want to capture this. And also we did put in a population density factor because we wanted to measure where people actually are. Um, and this, that's something we really cared about. What are people actually being exposed to? 
So with that, we created this um, was our was our goals in the beginning. And you can see we did, were able to deploy that relatively well over the last couple of years. Um, so the really cool thing about this this network is um, we can create really cool maps in real time. And also, so this is actually July 4th. Um, and this is nice because we can see human factors here. Um, we chose July 4th because we know people are shooting fireworks off in different neighborhoods. You know, there's a big city firework display. And you'll note here, so this is 16 going into the evening. We can see different neighborhoods produce more PM as they do their own fireworks. And so we can get these kind of high quality maps using this kind of um, network, which is really interesting. When we think before this, there was only one PM 2.5 monitor in the city, which is located here in Old Town. So this is all PM 2.5 or different monitors in the city you can see here. We're able to get really best guesses for PM 2.5 concentrations, even in between our monitoring sites. Um, and also great is we've built a portable version. So it's a smaller compact version of our stationary monitor. Obviously we have different things we had to consider. Um, we are asking people to carry these. So we want them to be you know, pretty inconspicuous. Um, so this is the actual portable monitor here. This here is like you know the head or the sampling port, which we would ask somebody to put on like a backpack. You can see here, these two students have them on their backpacks. I carried it to a conference. Um, I had like a satchel and this is kind of the brain of it here. So there's the, the you can see the co computer part as well as the battery. And you would just tuck that into whatever bag they have. Um, so if somebody just already carrying a backpack like these students, just tuck that in and just mount the, the port here for sampling. And then we have nice characterization of PM and what they're actually being exposed to here. Um, and again, um, we can see what we're measuring, which is multiple pollutants in this really small footprint. So we have oxidizing gases, which here is ozone and NO2 combined into one sensor, PM 2.5, carbon monoxide, NO2. In this one, we do have GPS because it really matters for people. We wanna know where they're being exposed and, and what concentrations. Um, and then also temperature and relative humidity. So just to kind of show a map, that I'm not highlighting anything particularly exciting about this one day. I just wanna highlight what we can do with this kind of monitor. Um, so here is an example of, I'm carrying it for this one. Uh, so we have our PM 2.5 mass concentration over day and the same exact data plotted as a function of GPS. So we have a GPS sensor built in and then the colors correspond to each other. So we can see this, the biggest circle here corresponds to the highest concentration here. And you don't have to look too much about the actual exposures here, but what we can see is you can see, you know, where I, this is actually where I went to a diner and I had breakfast. We see the higher concentrations. I was down here. I did some driving around the city. We can see the concentrations there. Um, this is the grocery store. And this is actually where I was driving um, and I was idling somewhere. I can't remember exactly. Um, but we can see where we're being exposed and to what concentrations. And that's really helpful to understand, you know, emissions. And the nice thing about this monitor is so this is a PM 2.5 map, but we can do that with any of these factors that we're also measuring. So if we are really interested in carbon monoxide, we can do a plot like this, real time GPS data and the carbon monoxide. And the other big question we're trying to answer is this reliability data on these low cost sensor networks. I mean, I've highlighted, there's a lot of potential. We can do these high density networks. We can do these high density personal monitoring. And there's a lot that can be done. Um, so we've, and we've done a lot to test these things out. So first of all, every portable and, set, and stationary monitor, every sensor in every monitor has a lab-based calibration. Um, so they all go through a chamber, you know, they get exposed to concentration of gas that we know and we have all of that data we save. But we also have things like co-locating multiple boxes at reference sites. So out in the real world, we have boxes side by side. Um, so that we have an idea of the, the differences between sensors that are measuring. Um, and this gives us confidence in boxes that are isolated. So if we have this, you know, inter-sensor comparisons at a reference site, we can really understand how the boxes will differ in time and in space um, outside of, you know, because we really care about the monitors that are out by themselves. We don't really care about monitors that are near the reference site. We want to have confidence in those monitors. Um, and other kind of questions we're trying to answer just for the community at large is determining if there's an optimal co-location link for reference data. For a lot of low cost sensors, what we'll do 
is we will co-locate our low cost sensor box at a reference site for an undetermined number of times. So it could be a week, it could be a month, something along those lines. And then we will move the sensor to the actual monitoring location. But the longer you co-locate, the less time you have at the real site to measure. And so we're trying to figure out the optimum co-location length so that people are getting more data at the site they really care about. And then also um, we look at things like identifying key factors that influence the sensors. So for example, some sensors may interact with another common pollutant. Um, they may interact with like temperature and RH. And they might also exhibit sensor drift or sensor aging. And that just means the sensor signal changes over time as the sensor is exposed to more pollution in the cumulative like over, over the year. Um, and here's just one example of I just, uh, one example of kind of these sensors out in the world. Um, so here is what we would do. So we have three sensors co-located at Baltimore, it's a downtown Baltimore site, it's MDE Old Town. And so we co-located three for about two months because we wanted to see if they all reported the same concentrations under different conditions. Um, and you can see here, it's like sometimes, well, first of all, let's say the three sensors actually do a good job of reporting similar concentrations which really gives us confidence that even if they were at separate sites, we could trust the concentrations would be similar if they were co-located. But it's also important to turn, determine from this is sometimes they do a really good job of matching reference data, which is this black line, and sometimes they do a really bad job of matching reference data. And this is due to environmental factors. But after we understand this and characterize this, we can fix that. So down below here, we see we've corrected for temperature in RH, and you can see we have a much better fit on these days. This day would have had a higher RH, which is a really important factor for the PM 2.5. And after we correct for temperature in RH, there's a correlation of 0 0.093, uh, just for this one sensor specifically. Um, and so, yeah, my next one, my last slide. Yeah. Um, and so we've done that for all of the sensors as well. Um, and so just kind of the last thought is leveraging these low cost networks. Um, so we really started off, you know, we have specific questions in mind, but we've learned there's so much more you can do with this. Um, for example, we, um, I started, started another project this year called the ARCHES study, which is assessment of respiratory symptoms in children using exposures from a sensor network. Basically what we did is we have children in different neighborhoods report their asthma symptoms. And we were comparing these asthma symptoms they reported with the ambient concentrations, because now we're able to see the differences at the neighborhood level in terms of ambient pollutants. We we're also able to evaluate changes in exposures during COVID in different neighborhoods. You know, many, con many studies look at the city level, which are very interesting, but we're interested in the neighborhood level. For example, we have one participant who lives near an Amazon warehouse. So you can imagine her exposures change differently and the participants who lived downtown where there was much less commuting exposures. And the last one is we're able to look at exposures to notable point sources. For example, there's a lot of questions about the incinerator in Baltimore, and we have a student looking at how what neighborhood that incinerator is actually impacting using our network and like wind direction. Um, and with that, um, I thank you for attention and I'll happy to take any questions. And I also have my email there if anybody just wants to shoot me an email instead. Great, thank you, Misty. Uh, there was one question on the chat from Go Yang Wu okay. about the uh, time resolution of the measurements um, within the Grimana yeah. platform. Yeah, great question. Um, so we actually get that, I think it's in 15 second averages, um, which we usually almost immediately average up to something much larger, you know, five minutes or an hour, but we do get that at less than every minute for every monitor. Any other yes. last second questions for Misty before we, yeah. yeah, go ahead, Misty. I was gonna say it also, just one nice thing about Grafana is that you can make it where it'll it'll average up to bigger times if you zoom out. So you're not loading five second data for 50 monitors and crash your computer, which is just a smart technique you can do. Oh, that's not my question. And not one we knew from the beginning. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes it takes a long time. That was a trial and error that involved crashing computers. <laughs> Great. Um, not seeing any additional questions. Thank you, 
Um, oh, Megan Lachow would like to know when the data will be ready for publication. Great question. Um, so the answer is some of it's already been pu um, published. So the like the Fourth of July map came from a paper from Abidata. Um, so like we've looked at. So, so basically, some of it's already out there in the world. Depends on the which study you're looking for. And Mary Fox asks about um, any observations on equity. I guess um, we're going for differences in exposures, like a, between lip, um, neighborhood types, I guess. I think so. Yeah. So we, we've had a couple or students. Populations of people. Mm -hmm. So we had one summer student that's actually one of her main questions. And so she looked at, you know, specifically, so for Mary, uh, she looked at, Curtis Bay and Fed Hill, Federal Hill, which is two very different populations in Baltimore, but they're actually side by side um, geographically. And so she was looking at exposures and these different populations and how they compared um, using our network, which is really interesting. But yes, the answer is, it's actually a question that we're really interested in looking at. Um, and we have a couple of students who have focused on that as well. Great, thanks, Ms. Davey. Yeah. For the sake of time, we'll move on to the next presentation. Uh, our next presenter is Masood Falaj Rashadi. And we have five video. There we go. Hi, Masood. Uh, and he'll be presenting on uh, estimating traffic related air pollution using a noise based model. We don't see your slides yet. There we go. Great. And in case you didn't notice, you are on mute. Thank you. Great. Hello, everyone. Let me introduce myself. Uh, I am Masood Falashushani from University of Southern California. What I'd like to present to you today is estimating traffic-related air pollution using a noise-based model. My talk is particularly relevant to those of you who are interested in near road pollution. As you know, traffic is the main source of air pollution in urban area. A statistic shows that 40% of the California's population lives near high volume roads. Uh, there are two approaches, measuring and equal modeling to define this uh, air pollution level. Measuring is a very expensive instrument and high maintenance. That's why they, they are installed in limited location. On the right side, map shows augmenting the station around Los Angeles. For example, AQMD, which covers four counties, has only four near road monitoring station. So, if you are interested to simulate traffic pollution in vast area as city, we should use a quality model. Here is a, one example of an auto concentration simulation in Montreal, Canada, using the modeling chain. This modern chain includes the traffic, emission, and dispersion model. And one of the biggest challenge is providing traffic data and the liability of emission model. So we propose an alternative solution to estimate a pollution using the traffic noise. Because vehicles emission and noise have sensors. Also, different noise frequency are able to present engine activity and the speed of cars based on tires and air turbulence noise. In addition, both air pollution and traffic noise depend on meteorological condition. When we talk about noise, it's not just the LIQ, which is the average of sound energy during a period of time, but also multi-frequency noise measurement as present in this figure. Depend on 
Octa band measurement, the noise could presented by 10 frequencies for one octave or 32 frequencies for third octave band. In this figure, you can see the third octave band. Based on previous study, the low frequency between 100 hertz to 200 hertz present engine noise and high frequency of 500 hertz to 2 kilohertz present higher rolling noise. In the next slide, I show the relationship between frequencies and vehicle activity. Here you can see the noise frequencies of a car with a speed of 130 km per hour in the left and 150 km in the right. Comparison of these figures show high frequency strongly increase with the speed. Another study shows different sound events between passenger car and truck in low frequencies, which allow us to distinguish our fluid composition in different cases. A European and European study also demonstrate frequency can define speed and acceleration even with similar LIQ or noise load. They show big difference of high and low frequency present high speed with no acceleration uh, that you can see in the left figure and a small difference between high frequency and low frequency present low speed with high acceleration. Now let's focus on advantage of noise-based model compared to air quality modeling using traffic and emission model. We know it's very rare to obtain traffic data as volume, speed, and density for all road over the network. And maybe the only solution is the navigator application that personally, as a researcher, I uh, don't have access to this data. The, about traffic models, they need details, network data, as lane number, direction, traffic, light timing, and etc. The drive's behavior integrated in this traffic model can be different of our case study and uh, vary country to country or even city to another city. Beside uh, we should consider the computational and aggregation error of this model. But noise could present more accurate real-time variation of traffic. We know emission model provide mass uncertainties of modeling chain goes up to 100% because of uh, don't include the update emission factors. Uh, moreover, this emission factor measured in laboratory could be different of uh, our case study. Also, emission factors are available only for the major April trends. And if we categorize emission to uh, exhaust, evaporation, non-exhaust, and its expansion, the emission model have limited measurement for non-exhaust emission and don't consider the this is function emission. Another advantage of noise-based model is uh, ability to provide the one minute concentration of pollutants versus or only result simulated by Gaussian model. For sure if we use the CFD model uh, we can have also uh, we can reduce the risk this temporal resolution of simulation, but needs really high computational times. In this part of presentation, I'd like to talk about 
our instrument and the complexity of measurement. Uh, in first step, we study the relationship of black carbon and noise. The main source of black carbon are combustion engine, especially diesel, residential burning of wood, power station, and forest and vegetation fires. We use a micro MH250 instrument that uh, have five different wavelengths to distinguish between black carbon sources to provide the black carbon emitted by vehicles. The interval sampling could be between 1 to 300 seconds. Our sound meter is Bruel and Cure type 2250 light that is able to measure octave and third octave band frequency with interval sampling on positive. Let's now take a look at measurement complexity. After several measurements, we find period of measurement should be long to capture traffic variation as different volume and speed. Uh, also, uh, the traffic condition as congestion or fluid. We tested 5, 10, and 60 seconds of black carbon sampling and found Measurement error in short sampling uh, interval of 5 and 10 seconds could be very high. And uh, if we aggregate noise data for more than 60 seconds, the noise variation could not be captured. The graph here shows the correlation between black carbon and noise frequency for 1 minute and 10 seconds sampling interval. Uh, as you can see, the correlation of black carbon with 10 seconds sampling in orange are negative or under 10%. However, 1 minute sampling data can present the relationship of black carbon and high frequency with a correlation of 45%. So the best compromise we find to measure the black carbon and noise at the same time is vomit. Now let's look at the effect of low volume of traffic. The orange line is the correlation between black carbon and frequency during night that show black carbon of uh, in the situation of low traffic volume cannot correlate uh, very well with noise frequency. Now, presently we are working on black carbon because the variation of black carbon is greater than PM2.5 and it's also related mostly to truck. Uh, we know NO2 is better marker of traffic, so we installed our instrument in Long Beach, a monitoring station of AQMD, uh, which allows us to compare a uh, noise level with NO2, which we believe we can find better correlation between um, noise frequency and NO2. The next step is using the GAN and machine learning model to find best approach to estimate traffic related pollution. In conclusion, uh, we explore an alternative approach to estimate uh, near road air pollution. This approach may be possible by analyzing noise frequency and the meteorological situation. And this approach is advantage because of low cost of noise meter. Uh, we find also sampling interval of one minute is a good compromise to measure black carbon and noise. Uh, also vehicle categories such as uh, passenger car, truck, bus can be defined based on sub-frequency of the nodes. And 
we can use this fluid composition of the different category of car and also speed to serve as input to, to emission model and again use it in the chain by uh, modeling chain to provide a pollution concentration. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, there's one question so far uh, on the Q&A from Farzan, um, asking about how you could incorporate uh, EVs into your model that have much lower engine noise. So <clears throat> for the black carbon, uh, I don't think the EV cars provide the black carbon and also, you know, too bad, uh, so uh, I don't know exactly how we can explain the, the what is the emission we, we expect that the, the EV cars provide it's just a non-exhaust emission and we can just focus on the particle but the EV cars now we are concentrated in black carbon and you know to uh, EV cars don't provide none of this Content. But uh, I, I can say uh, it's very hard and maybe to find the, the energy frequency of EV between the, uh, you know, in the other vehicles. But they don't also contribute to the pollution. They probably at least kick up road dust and things, right? <laughs> but perhaps yeah. not their own emissions. Do you have an idea of, um, you know, if, if this is successful and you wanted to actually deploy a network across the city, what type of uh, noise sensors do you have in mind to be able to do that? Are you guys at that stage? So actually, we have the uh, Burrell and Care noise meter. But there are also cheaper noise meter that can uh, measure the different frequencies. So, but this sound meter should should measure the frequency, not just the LIQ of the noise. Thank you, Farzan. Yeah. It seems tricky when you have to um, keep it away from the elements <laughs> at lots of locations. <laughs> Uh, great. Well, thank you for that presentation. Uh, we'll move on to our last speaker of the session. Uh, our last speaker today is Myra Chavez, who will be uh, presenting today on modeling spatiotemporal estimate to traffic related air pollutants in a near highway micro environment. And let's see. Great. I see your slides now. Take it away. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Maya Chavez, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Texas, El Paso. And I'll be presenting a work titled Modeling Spatial Temporal, Temporal Exposures to Traffic-Related Air Pollutants in a Near Highway Microenvironment. And this is a quick overview. We'll be covering the methodology, which involves moves emission rates um, the dispersion model setup, the traffic and air quality results, and then the air mod results in discussion. So a near road community is expected to observe significant spatial and temporal variations in pollutant concentrations. And in this study, the model pollutant that we analyzed was particulate matter 2.5. And we define a community being near a major road if the high um, if the road has a high annual average daily traffic counts, generally higher than 100,000. And the highway we investigated in this study has an ADT of 107,000. And this study attempts to characterize the community exposures using monitored and modeled PM2.5 data with the objective to develop spatial and temporal pollutant concentration variation patterns and apportion the differences in exposure concentrations to background concentrations 
and those contributed from major highways. So the spatial and temporal pollutant concentration variation patterns for a near road community were developed using traffic modeling outputs and EPA's moves and air mod model in conjunction with real-time traffic counts and meteorological data. And this study was implemented in five phases, which include traffic data collection, air pollution measurements, emission modeling, air dispersion modeling, and data processing and reporting. And here we can see the location of all the collection sites of traffic in air quality monitoring data. We have two near road sites, which are um, H and CW. And CW is an elementary school and H is a residential home near the highway. And they're both located within um, 10 meters from the frontage road at US 54. And the third air quality monitoring site is 300 meters away from the frontage road of US 54. And this area was selected based on the traffic conditions, the proximity to the highway, and the direction of the prevailing winds. And we also have the locations of the tube counters in the black diamonds, and they were in arterials that have um, higher uh, AADT than the rest of the streets in the area. And these are the monitors we use to track uh, count traffic data in these arterials that we put two tube counters at each of the three sites in the road. And we also use text uh, traffic cameras and that counting was done visually with hand counters by three um, operators. And we also have travel demand model estimates provided by the El Paso MPO. And the air quality monitoring data was collected at the three sites using the Grim Portable Laser Monitor to collect PM2.5 data. And here we can see a view of the three sites. The two near road sites, you can see the frontage road from each side and they're less than eight meters from the frontage road. And the community site is around 300 meters from uh, the highway. And for the dispersion model setup, we use traffic and vehicle data to calculate the emission rates of PM2.5. So we started with 180 links that were modeled with moves to provide emission rates for four time periods for weekday and weekend. And then from this micro scale concentration surfaces were established and concentrations at the discrete receptors and the gridded receptors were um, used to quantify the total exposure of the New York community. So using the 180 links model from MOVES, we use 180 line sources in AirMod with uh, 2,500 gridded receptors to calculate the PM2.5 at each receptor. And the emission rates were used that were for the four peak time periods were extrapolated to all hours of the day for weekday and weekend. And then background concentrations were estimated from regional air quality monitors. So the diurnal trends of the weekday and weekend traffic that we uh, obtained from the three tube counter locations on the arterials are shown in the top. And then the bottom one is from the highway counts from the video um, cameras. And we can see that for the weekday, traffic peaked in the morning at around 7 and then again at 5 p.m., while the weekend peaked in the early afternoon and continued up throughout the day. And the community site that was um, 300 meters from the site will um, show lower traffic than observed at the other two sites. And traffic for US 54 shows that during the morning uh, peak on weekdays, southbound traffic is higher than the northbound traffic. Uh, the northbound is purple and southbound is red. And we can see that this trend is reversed in the evening peak hours, but the southbound traffic during the morning peak is around 50% higher than the northbound traffic. So we're going to see the effects of uh, the difference between northbound and southbound on our sites. So for the monitored PM2.5 using our GRIM monitor, PM2.5 
was observed to peak in the morning around 7 a.m., as well as in the afternoon. And the morning peak coincided well with the morning traffic, but the early afternoon traffic peak from the last slide correlates well with the non-school related traffic during the weekdays, whereas PM 2.5 appears to be more correlated to regional air pollution, indicating that the regional air pollution is likely to be more prevalent in the near road community rather than the emissions from the highway. And it is also observed that PM 2.5 values peak um, in the late night hours, especially peaking overnight due to reduced atmospheric mixing. So the model estimates from the air mount dispersion model were combined with background PM 2.5, which were obtained from the local TCQ um, monitor, continuous air monitoring stations. And those were used to create the total modeled estimates. And the PM 2.5 concentration estimates resulting from traffic emissions from US 54 were generated using AirMod, and the surfaces were generated using the discrete receptors as well as the 2500 graded receptors. And here we show the spatial distribution of PM 2.5 um, at the maximum one hour and maximum 24 hour and the period average uh, shown clockwise. And these figures provide a clear illustration of the PM 2.5 exposure in the community due to the traffic related pollutant emissions in the area based on the line sources modeled and the receptors modeled. And we can see also that the arterials with higher traffic volume also account for higher estimates of PM 2.5 exposures in the community. For the modeling, each source was also placed into three different source groups, which allow the model to consider the impact of each source group on the receptors. And these groups were arterial, um, gateway, and highway. And the arterial traffic is defined as occurring on the four lane arterials in the study area, which all have AADT lower than 100,000. And we can see from the table that the percent of contributions to PM2.5 by each source group on the three receptors, which are the two near road receptors, House and Colwell and Bradford, the community monitor. We can see that for the near road receptor, the contributions from the highway were greater than 80%, whereas contributions from the highway on the community monitor, which was located 300 meters away, was around 50%. And the contributions from the frontage road on the southbound side were around 5%, whereas the contributions on the northbound side were around 1.4%. And this is because of the higher traffic volumes that we see on the southbound compared to the northbound. And also because it's Coldwell is the one that is adjacent to the elementary school and the frontage road that leads to the elementary school. Here we show the model to monitor time series comparisons of PM 2.5 emissions during the study period. And the figures are divided into two weekly periods. The elements labeled with model are those that just include the, or that include the model through air mod and the background. So model H, for example, is the air mod model results and the background value. And then monitor is what we monitored with our grim monitor. And the red dotted line is the background data we use from a camp station located around four miles from the site, which was uh, at UTEP. And as we can see that background concentrations account for a significant portion of the PM 2.5 exposure near or off the highway. And local traffic impacts occurring on the four lane arterials we've discussed account for approximately 10% um, of the total exposure. So that is to say that the modeled results shown in the figures are driven largely by the regional background concentrations that 
we chose to use or that we had available to us based on our background monitors available in the area. So based on this, we can say that for our first objective, we predicted the highest concentration estimates at locations where the traffic volume is the highest and also downwind of the dominant winds. And the model accuracy improves for long-term average between um, one hour, 24 hour average or period average. And the comparison involved the addition of the hourly background concentrations obtained from the UTEP campsite, which is four miles away. And it turns out that this background value is often higher than the concentrations we observed at the near road sites, which are 10 meters away from US 54. And we also know that the model is sensitive to the wind speed and wind direction and emission rates, which result in higher estimates for the site located east of the highway, near the higher traffic roads, compared to the other near road site, which were the same distance from the road, but one had a higher traffic volume. And this indicates that the maximum value captured by air mod may be obscured in, obscured in real life exposure due to the ubiquity of background PM2.5 concentrations in these urban areas. And the conclusions for our second objective, we see that for model values, the two new road sites experience 87% and 89% of PM2.5 contribution from the highway and the community monitor experiences 50% of PM2.5 contribution from the highway. And the monitored values show exposure to PM2.5 is lar largely due to the background concentration in the urban area. And the traffic related emissions from the highway were around 4.8 times higher than the contributions made by the local arterial roads. And our recommendations for further research would be to establish your, our own field monitor for background estimate rather than the camp station, which was four miles away, and evaluate different pollutants that are correlated to traffic emissions, such as NO2 or um, black carbon, or, and run a more detailed sensitivity analysis using the dispersion model with different source characterizations or meteorological conditions or land use parameters. And that's it. Um, uh, we would like to thank Ivan for helping with the airmet processing, and this research was partially supported by TechStuff. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, please use the, the question and answer for any questions. Um, I'll ask one question. What uh, type of characteristics would you like um, a different background site to try to capture? Well, the background site we chose, uh -huh, maybe that's, it happens to also be near the university, which might have higher traffic. But we can see that the background monitor was almost the same as our near road monitor. So it might have to be using more background monitors to find a distribution, a better distribution of the PM2.5. And Akula asks, if PM2.5 concentrations are dominated by background, how reliable are your estimates of highway contributions? Yeah, that's the issue that we're, we're trying to find the sensitivity of the air mount model and define whether um, background concentrations could help improve the estimates that we made. The estimates on the source contributions are based on just the traffic uh, AEDT. So those were before we added the background concentrations. So those are just based on the model predictions for the traffic. Without the, the measurements of the three sites. Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. We only have about one minute left in this session if anyone would like to get in a last question. Otherwise, uh, I would like to thank all of our speakers for uh, the really interesting and varied talks that we saw today uh, and thank everybody for their attention and participation in this session.
have a good rest of the conference. Bye.